So you got your character design and now you want to model it in 3D. First, get your hands on some 3D software like Blender or Maya. Blender is free and is what I use, however I've also used Maya and I can say the knowledge from one program to the other transfers pretty easily, so it doesn't really matter which one you use. You might have to do a lot of googling to find equivalent hotkeys and functions if you use Maya to follow along here, but on the upside you'll have some better UV unwrap tools to work with once you get to the texturing stage, as I can say from experience, Blender's is quite limited in comparison. It'll still get the job done though. I'm about to go over a bunch of stuff really rapid fire to try to get you up to speed on the basics of how to operate with a 3D modeling program. If I'm going too fast for you, or if you already know how to do all this stuff, skip to this part of the video. Here's what you're going to want to do. Select all this stuff, press the on your keyboard, get rid of it, you don't need it. Here we are in the three-dimensional world. You can scroll your wheel to zoom, you can click your middle mouse button to rotate, you can hold shift and click your middle mouse button to pan. Uh, second thing, click add, go to image, reference. Navigate to wherever you have your turnaround reference images. You should have probably saved them as two separate things, one for uh, the front view and one for the side view. Add it to the thing. Press N to open up this little panel thingy here. Uh, get all of these to zero, because that's not how we want it to be. Alright, we need to get this thing off the dang floor. Now, if you look at the top right here, you will see an indicator of your XYZ axes thingies. Uh, this right here, this unlabeled green dot, is where your model should be facing. The Y should be at the back of your model. So we pretty much just have to rotate it along the X axis here. Uh, think of it as a wheel, basically. We can click this, we can go to a rotate tool here, and we can like do it like this. But to be precise, we're just gonna go to X rotation up here and type in 90 exactly, and there you go. You're, think of it as a wheel that is rotating around like the long metal rod holding it up in a car. That's what I mean whenever I say rotate around a specific axis. Now you're gonna want to move this uh, back a little bit. Now you might want to just like grab this, but if you do that, it's not perfectly centered anymore. The X is no longer zero. So you can grab the Y arrow and move it exactly along just the Y. You can do the same here, put along the Z axis, or you can click this little square here and it'll move along both of them and wherever you want it, but it'll still remain perfectly centered on the X axis, not going left or right at all. So I'm going to put this around here for now, and um, we are now going to add a cube. Because, you see, we don't actually know how big this thing is right now. For all we know, this could be like 2 inches tall, or like 50 feet tall, and you probably don't really want that when you are uh, importing it into a game. So in order to figure out what size it's actually supposed to be, we spawn a cube, and we can see the exact dimensions of this cube right here. Now if you're a normal person, just type in the height that your character is supposed to be for the z-axis right here. If you're an American, however, uh, feet... Um... I'm 6 feet tall, exactly. 1.82, we'll round that up to about 1.83, because I'm slightly above 6 feet tall. So we'll just type in 1.83 here. As you can see, our reference image is actually way too big. This is how tall the model should be. Uh, we want to perfectly position this so that the bottom is right along the grid, like the floor here, instead of going underneath of it. Uh, you can click this up here, like one of these dots, to get a perfectly flat view, or you can press the key on your keyboard. Uh, one on the numpad sets it to a perfectly flat front view, for example. And we can just line this up right here. Let me actually just move this for a second so it's not in my way. I'm going to zoom all the way in here. Uh, now you can move things without having access to the manipulator object over there. Oh shit, did I forget to mention how to actually get to the move tool? You click over here to get to the move tool. You probably figure that out. If not, I apologize. But anyway, you can also move things without doing that by pressing G. And now we're moving it all over wherever. And we can move it along only a particular axis by pressing G and then that axis. So we want the Z axis right here. Now we are only moving it vertically up and down. So we'll get that right along there. And there we go. If I wanted it to be perfectly precise, I could have done something different, but it doesn't have to be perfectly precise. Now, we're gonna take this right here and try to line it up with the cube. We can move it over temporarily. Uh, now, you're gonna wanna press S to scale it on down. Try to get the bottom of the feet directly lined up with the cube here, and the top of the head directly lined up with the cube. So it takes a little minor bit of trial and error, 
But that looks pretty good. It's like in between the top of the head and the hair, so whatever. Uh, I want to set it back to exactly the center, so I'm just going to type 0 on the X up here. And there we go. Cool, we got our reference properly positioned and scaled. Gonna get rid of this cube now. Don't need them. And we're going to add a, another reference image. So the same process as before. Let's set all these to 0 first of all. Rotate along the X again. Now I'm gonna press 3 on the numpad to get a side view looking at it in this direction. We're gonna rotate it 90 degrees along the Z. You can type in 90 up here like I did for the X, but another easy way to do it is you can rotate something and then type in a number. For example, 90 degrees, and it'll rotate it exactly 90 degrees. You can also do the same thing we did with moving it, where we can type in a specific axis. So if I press R to rotate, then Z to rotate around the Z-axis, and then 90, then it rotates 90 degrees along the Z-axis. This can also be used to scale things. If I press S, and then let's say I want it to be really tall, I could type in Z, and I could type in 5, and then we stretch it along the Z by the factor of 5. It's a handy little thing to know. But anyway, we want this to be the same size as this, so we're just going to copy the scale factor here. Whoopsies, I didn't... Oh... And then we'll paste it in here. Bam. We can also copy the Z location so it will be perfectly lined up. Assuming these images are the same dimensions, uh, you should have probably made these the same exact dimensions, at least height-wise. Otherwise, uh, you'll have to do the cube thing again, probably. I'm sorry. Slide that over there. And there's your references. Wow, Mako, you might be thinking. That's good and all, but how do I actually fucking make the dang thing? Well, it's easy. You just click add and add a cube. That's add cube. And there you have it. This is your model. This is what your model is going to come out of. There is a difference between object mode and edit mode. Object mode lets you slide around entire things, essentially. Edit mode allows you to actually edit those things. Like so. Now, what exactly is an object? Well, an object is listed up here in your scene collection. This cube is one object. If I were to add, say, a cylinder, move this around a little bit, this is another object, also known as a mesh. We have two separate things here. We have our cube and we have our cylinder. If we click on one of these things and we go into edit mode, we can edit the vertices or lines and faces of this, but not this one because this is a separate object. We try to click here, nothing happens. We gotta go to object mode, click on this one, and then go into edit mode to get this one. Now throughout our model, we may have several objects that are part of the same overall model, but are not necessarily connected. Maybe we'll be using this as hair or something. You know, we'll have some hair draping down there, and it's not actually connected but we don't necessarily need it to be. And then at a certain point, especially for things like VRChat, we will merge our meshes, which involves shift-clicking on multiple things and control J to join them, and now this is a single object. And if we go into edit mode, we can now control the vertices of both of these, and if we wanted, we could also physically connect them to each other. For example, uh, I delete this face, move this up here, delete this face, you know, I could like physically move these vertices towards each other and then merge them. I'll explain how to do that in more detail later on, but that's just a quick rundown of object and edit mode. At this point, I would like to explain something somewhat abstract, but important. Now the thing is, when you move or scale something around in object mode, it's kind of like... It, it can mess with things, is all I, I can really say. So you want to try to keep that to a minimum. You'll also notice that the origin point of the thing is now up here, instead of in the center where it was before. That is also important. As a general rule of thumb, you should usually try to make sure all of these things right here, uh, location, rotation, and scale, are set to zero or one for the scale in object mode. Because if it's like this, weird things start to happen later on with certain interactions, just trust me. There are times where you will want to change things in object mode, but for now, uh, stick to edit mode for this. 
You can quickly change between it by uh, going up here or just pressing tab. And you'll notice that if I go over to move here, um, I can select whatever. I can also press A to select all. And then I move it like over here. I scale it down, do whatever I want with it. Uh, the origin of this object is still down here directly in the center. This is the point of reference for this object. Essentially, if I did move it in object mode up here, whoop, and then like, let's say I turn this into the head and I had some feet coming down off of it or whatever, well, the origin is right here. So when it spawns inside of a game, games usually put the origin at, right at the center on the floor. So you might find out that once you're in game, it ends up putting your head inside the floor down there. So keep things normal here. Go to edit mode. You can now begin changing things. You can grab a vertex and move it around. You can grab a line and move it around, or even an entire dang face. It's really annoying having to click up here every time you want to do something like that, but you can press 1, 2, and 3 on your keyboard to quickly go between modes. Control Z to undo all that garbage I just did. Now, step one. Uh, we do not want to make our model twice, so what we're going to do is hit Control R to place an edge loop down the center along the y-axis, well around the x-axis but like in the center facing forwards. Just left click there and then right click to put it in the exact center. Select everything on one side of it, you can hold shift to select multiple things, hit delete, delete faces, now we have one half of a cube. Go into the wrench icon right here, this is your modifiers. Add a mirror modifier. Now, anything we do to one side will also happen to the other side. You'll notice we can only see vertices over here. If you click this, then you can edit things on either side, which I usually tend to do. It's up to you, though. Well, it lets you select them, and the transform thing will still be over here, but uh, whatever. You will probably want to enable clipping, because if you don't and you move something towards the center, um, you probably don't want that to happen, but if you enable clipping, and you move things toward each other, they merge. This is now one thing right here, exactly in the center. You might find that at some point you want to move things very close to each other, but once you get beyond a certain point, uh, things like start auto-merging when you try to move them. For that, just lower the merge limit, add a couple extra zeros after that decimal point, and you should be good. By the way, you see how it's annoyingly clipping through here? Go to view up here, change the clip start, add a couple zeros after that decimal point. Bam. Do you see how the camera is like not aligned over here? Press delete or the period on your uh, numpad. Bam. We're centered. All right on what we're selected. I'm just trying to rapid fire through these tips as fast as possible to try to uh, get you up to speed on how to do this. Now that we have our cube, then we know how to manipulate things. We're gonna go ahead and let me get this back to where it should be. Oh, another tip right here. You want these two things to be perfectly lined up, uh, select one of those, select this, hit by hitting shift click. Now, we want these to be perfectly aligned, uh, like going like this. Hit S to scale, hit X to scale along the uh, X. And now we can, well, we can do that, or we can press zero. We have scaled it along the x-axis to zero. These two points are now exactly in the same x location. So let's start modeling. I'm going to press 1 to go to the front view here. Oh, looks like we got some things that are not lined here either, so I'm going to do the same thing. SX0. This is a combination you will often find yourself using. SX0. We want to be able to line this up with this thingy, so click on this up here. We now see through. Press A to select all. Move it up. Scale it down. It's gonna get a little weird because of our mirror modifier, but that's okay. Just slide it into place and start getting what you need to get. Move things into place. Line them up with the body. Line, uh, line it up with the body, not the clothes. I'm not gonna be trying to model in these clothing folds yet. It's generally best to make an entire naked body first and then put the clothes on top of it. Now we're gonna need a little more deal. Oh, oh, wait, hang on, this ain't right. Let's press 3 to go to the side view. And, um, well, let's grab one of these actually. Move that back. Press R to rotate. Get it in the rough general shape. 
And we're going to need a bit more detail, so let's add another edge loop. Let's press Ctrl R again, click here, but this time we're going to slide it up to um, about there. Actually, I want it to be a little lower down, but I've already placed it. I could go back and do it again, or I could go up here, click Edge, Edge Slide, and move my mouse down. It's kind of hard to see, but it's down here now. There we go. Now, if we press Alt while in uh, Edge Mode, and we select this, press Alt and then left click, we have selected an entire edge loop. Alt click selects an entire loop of things going around. It doesn't really work here because it's like the middle of a thing, but if I like were to add a thing here, then I um, did it there, then you would see we would select the entire thing. It also works on faces. You can press Alt and then select all those faces. It goes in whatever direction you're closer to, so if I want to select like this cross section that I just did, I hit it towards this. But if I want to go horizontally, I will alt click here. Oop. Let me turn off x-ray. I would alt click right here. And it would select that face loop going around like that. Oop. Oop. Anyways, I don't actually need this edge loop that I added for demonstration, so I'm going to click this, uh, hit delete, and dissolve edges. Bam, now it's gone. Notice that I dissolved it rather than deleted it. If I were to delete it, then, um, well, we don't really want that to happen. Alright, so anyways, I'm going to select this edge loop, go back to, oh, go back to side view, and move it to line up with this a little bit better. I want a little bit extra thickness here going forwards, but I don't necessarily want to just, like, scale it raw, because, well, I guess we do kind of need it a little bit here as well. But let's say we didn't. Let's say we only wanted to scale it this way. We would press S and then Y to scale it along the Y. And we can line that up just right. Uh, we're going to clearly need another edge loop right here. So let's get that. Uh, let's maybe select this edge up here and move that down to where it ought to be. Same with this one. And it's basically just a matter of, uh, yeah. If you keep at this, eventually you will find yourself with a torso. You might find that you need to kind of grab the corners here. Uh, let's go to a top view by hitting 7 and kind of move them inward so that it's not just like cubular. There, that's a bit more reasonable. But we should, we should probably have an edge loop down the middle here exactly. Uh, we can move this out a little bit more, or scale it along the X. Pretty much does the same thing here. And there, you can already see, this is almost like a sack of meat. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else I should be going over for you to know. Uh, let's see, important things. This is the uh, viewport display up here. If you click this little arrow, you can mess with a whole bunch of things, like enabling normals. Uh, if you click it and disable it, you will kind of lose track of everything and you'll just kind of see the raw shape you're working with. You can go to object mode, click on a thing, right click shade smooth to, well, shade it smoothly. You can add a modifier here, subdivision surface, and see what it'll look like with more polygons. You'll probably want your render and viewport numbers to be the same. There's a reason we're doing this instead of just like adding the extra polygons raw. It's a lot easier to add extra detail than it is to remove extra detail. Let me show you, for example. Like, let's say I apply this subdivision surface modifier. It would, like, like up this a lot. It would make it so that it's no longer a modifier. Right now, the way it's working is we still have our actual mesh, and in fact, we can click this to disable it and look at what we had before. I'm going to shade this flat again because I don't like how that looks. We still have our original mesh right here. Everything is exactly the same. It's just that we can see what it would look like if we were to add more polygons to it. Uh, we can click this right here to make it a bit less dumb. There we go. This is like on the actual thing now. And let's say we wanted to apply this. Don't ever apply your subdivision surface modifier until you're ready to, which is going to be very, very late in the process. But if we were stupid and we applied it, then, um, wow, look at all of this. What if I were getting ready to go into like VR chat or something and I realized I had way too many polygons and the game is not going to want me to be able to have my avatar in it? What if I realize my performance is terrible and I need to get rid of a bunch of things? Well, I would have to like basically fucking go in and individually dissolve all these edges and stuff and it's a nightmare.
Whereas if we have a low poly thing and we want it to be higher poly, we literally just add the subdivision surface modifier and then we're good. Of course, you'll have to, you know, compensate here and there a couple places because you do end up losing like a lot of detail, but you can add things like, say we add another edge loop right here. Uh, we Maybe we don't like how smooth this is. What we can do is we can click this. I'll go to the item tab right here and add a crease to it. Uh, it's kind of hard. Here, let me move it in here more. Like without the crease, it smooths out, but with the crease, you can see, well, it creases. I'm going to, uh, first of all, set this back to like one or two, maybe two. Yeah, that's probably about right. But I'm going to disable it for now. Um, right now, we're just going to keep working with low poly. Uh, let's add a neck as a demonstration real quick. Um, I want to cut a thing here. How do I do that? Press K for cut. And I'm going to click uh, right here. And actually, no, I'm going to... I'm going to click, you can press escape to cancel out. I'm going to click on this line, and then this line, and then that line, and hit enter. Now we can select these faces here, hit delete, delete the faces, and bam, we got a neck hole. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wow, Mako, this looks like fucking garbage. But look at what I'm working with right here, alright? This is what I started with. It will get alright eventually, trust me. Speaking of garbage, however, we have some five-sided polygons here. That's bad, for reasons I don't entirely understand. But you should try to avoid them. You should try to make sure everything is four-sided, and except for certain cases where it's kind of fine, like um, like if you have like a cylinder, you can have the edge of that be... Uh, in general, try to have four-sided shapes. How could we ever fix this, though? It's five sides. Well, what if we hit Control R and added an edge loop right here? And then we took our knife tool and hit that and put it right there. And then another one right there. Hit Enter. Bam, we fixed it. Generally, adding edge loops or removing edge loops tends to fix certain things. It can eventually be like a puzzle game where you gotta figure out, like, what kinds of things, like where you gotta cut, where you gotta add extra uh, geometry, where you gotta remove extra things and dissolve lines and stuff to keep that quadrilar shape stuff going on. But anyway, let's add the neck. I'm gonna alt click to select this edge loop here. And I'm gonna go into a perfect, well, it's a side view. Hit E to extrude. And bam, 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 what do you know? We got ourselves a dang neck. This is awful. Hang on. I need to like line this up. This should not be this wide. It's very square. What does it look like like this? Okay, there we go. That looks a little bit better. Uh, let me demonstrate another thing real quick. Let's say let's say we added a head. Don't actually do what I'm about to do, but I'm gonna hit this and then hit face. No mesh. The face. Grid fill. Nope. Not enough things for that. Just regular fill. It's not worth fuck. Wait, no. Get that and then hit uh, F to fill? Okay, yeah, whatever. And we like extrude it again and... Uh... Alright, so let's say you already modeled in your head. This is not how you would do it, but let's pretend you did. And you realize, oh no, my neck, it's too thin or too thick or whatever. How do I change that? I get a uh, hit alt click to select the edge loop, or the face loop rather. And like I could hit S to scale it up and down, but it's scaling the other dang things with it. I don't want it to do that. I just want it to go outwards all the way. Allow me to introduce you to Alt S, scaling along normals. When you hit Alt S, things scale in the direction that they are facing, in every way all around. It is incredibly handy, and I did know about it for a very long time, and I'm mad. Just remember that you can do this as an alternative to regular scaling. It will come in handy a lot of times. Alright, let's see, a couple other important things. In case you couldn't figure it out, you can do that thing where you type in something for any kind of transform, whether it's moving it, rotating it, scaling it. Let's say I wanted this edge right here to be exactly half its size. I can press S, type in 0 0.5, and now it's half its size. And then Ctrl Z to undo that. Also, this is one of those programs where to redo something, you press Ctrl Shift Z, instead of just Ctrl Y. Kind of easier like this, I guess. This right here is proportional editing. If you enable that, then things... Uh, okay, so you're going to want to 
While you're moving this, scroll your mouse wheel up until the circle becomes a reasonable size. Now, you can control how big it is and control the radius of influence. And essentially it'll start dragging things other than what you've selected along with you. This becomes incredibly useful later on once you have more detail. Just keep it in mind. Like for example, let's say I want this right here to be a little bit wider, but I don't want to go through the effort of like, you know, let's say I had this off, I didn't want to like scale that and oh now this looks a little bit weird, now I gotta scale that, uh, now I gotta scale this a little bit more as well. Like no, don't need to do all that, just turn on proportional editing, I can hit S, hit X, and then um, as I'm doing this I can scroll the wheel up to reduce its influence and down to increase its influence. However, let's say we have like some fucking pretend these are fingers, I, I don't know. Let's say we, we had something here and like I wanna I wanna manipulate these faces a little bit. I wanna drag this like this and have this follow me a little bit. But wow, it's getting this part too. I don't want that. Click here. Connected only. There you go. It will be less dumb now. Now you could keep doing this and just, you know, block out all the shapes to get to the silhouette right and all that stuff, but I'm gonna have to stop you there. See, the silhouette of your model isn't the only important thing. If we want this to not look like a polygonal nightmare whenever a limb bends, we need to be very careful with how we make it and with how our edge loops are set up. For example, when it comes to making the legs, you might be tempted to, uh, oh I don't know, Let's say, you know, put an edge loop right here or whatever to give a little bit of space there. And then just kind of grab this and extrude downwards. However, if we were to actually bend this leg, let me just demonstrate for you real quick and also give you a brief tip about the 3D cursor. Press Shift S. You can click on a cursor to selected. You can also go, uh, let's see, is it here? Yeah, 3D cursor. You can set the location to uh, right about in the middle of the legs there. And then if we select something and we change this up here to 3D cursor, things will now rotate around there whenever we uh, rotate something. So if we were to rotate this, you know, let's turn that off. Um, well, things just don't really look the best. This is going to look super bad when you bend them. Instead, what you want to do is have a sort of bikini line shape. Something a little bit like... Oh, let me turn that back to normal. Medium point. Something a bit like that. Now, of course, there's very little geometry here, so this still isn't going to look good. But if we were to uh, bend it like this... And I can't really demonstrate to you what the difference is because there just isn't enough geometry here and we haven't actually like done any weight painting or rigging or anything. But trust me, it's gonna look better once you start rigging it if it looks like this. Your edges should follow the same pattern your skin follows as it creases around bending points. Now generally speaking, some of the most important uh, edge loop locations and orientations are as follows. First of all, of course, you want that sort of bikini line shape around where the hips connect to the thighs. Around joints, you will want more of them. So like, for example, along the legs, we might have a couple here like this. But as you get to areas that bend, you want more of them so that there is more geometry to deform as those parts bend. Same around here, of course. The face is also incredibly important. You want circular rings around the mouth and around the eyes. If you want me to explain why, uh, I, it's hard to explain, but basically this helps these parts open and close more. As your eyes blank, as your mouth opens, um, the more there is here, the more these lines kind of have room to expand outwards without like... It's hard to explain, I'm not an expert on this. And then of course, you know, uh, maybe you would have wanted to start your face with just a simple cube and, you know, just shape it into how you want. Like, you can get some nice quads here and, like, you'd want to, um, you know, 
Maybe this would be easier if I showed it in Blender, but we're already here, so whatever. You want to manipulate it so like that's the chin that gets squished down, and then for your eyes, you would just, I don't know, draw some like simple quad structures with your edge loops or whatever, and like, oh yeah, there's, there's an eye right there. But um, you really want these concentric circles that go like this with all the edges around them with the quads. And then of course you're going to have to figure out how to actually connect those to each other without having some weird uh, triangles. Like I could put this here and then like this here, but then uh, what the hell do you do here? You got all this space, do you put like an extra thing here? Or... And now we've got like a five-sided thing right here, which we don't want. So maybe we'll, uh, I don't know, go down and, you know, you gotta figure out how to do it. If nothing else, keep that in mind. You want circles around the mouth, around the eyes. You want this setup right here. You want extra topology around, extra edge loops around joints. If nothing else, keep those things in mind and figure out how to work with it. Also, these might not be at the right angle. They might, you might want them to go like kind of higher up like this. Because as your leg bends, like this is kind of where it'll actually start to crease or something. Uh, it's, it's weird, especially on models with uh, interesting proportions. Of course, it's all well and good to tell you what your model's supposed to look like once it's done, but how do you actually get there? Well, here's the thing. I am not an expert on this. I can show you the absolute basics and give you some tips and tricks, but it would be incredibly irresponsible of me to pretend I knew how to adequately teach you to do everything that goes into making a proper model. If you asked me to make a new model from scratch without following along with the videos I followed along with to make this one, I don't even know how many things I'd screw up. So if you were expecting me to give you a full rundown on this entire process myself, I'm sorry to say I don't feel very qualified to do that, and I'm going to have to direct you elsewhere. Now, if you want, you'd watch any number of courses on YouTube. Now that we have multiple objects in the scene, you can uh, select the multiple objects by holding down the shift key. If I select this one and hold down the shift key, I can select the multiple objects. Okay. And uh, if you want to deselect any object, you can just hold the shift key. But if you're like me, you do not have the fucking patience for that. So I'm not going to tell you to sit through all the fundamentals. I mean, you can if you want, but that's not how I personally prefer to learn when it comes to these things. I'm not doing this professionally. I don't need to know every single function of this program inside and out. I just want the very specific pieces of knowledge that I'll need to make use of for my one singular purpose. I got other shit to do. I ain't about to dedicate my life to modeling a myriad of different things. I just want to make an avatar. So considering you clicked on a video teaching you how to make an avatar, I'm going to assume that you're only currently interested in that specific knowledge as well. When I made my first model, I followed this guide. This guide does a wonderful job of being entertaining and informative while getting straight to the point of things, and without him, I probably would have never tried modeling. This series of him making a wizard lizard is an excellent place to start if you've never touched 3D software in your life and you want to make something simple like a little animal friend. I, however, used it as a guide to create an alien with a very human-like body structure, and, well, let's just say I bit off a bit more than I could chew. See, when it comes to creating something as detailed as a humanoid, you'll find yourself with a lot of questions on how to actually do things properly. I know I did. I'm still proud of this model, especially for it being my first ever 3D endeavor, and I think it looks mostly passable, but this thing is an absolute mess under the hood. Look at this. And this. And that, and oh my god! See, I couldn't really find a similarly comprehensive high-quality guide on making more complex characters at the time. At least not for my purposes. There were plenty of general 3D modeling guides, but this guy was making it specifically with VR chat in mind, just like I was doing. It's incredibly frustrating trying to find guides that match the criteria of what you're trying to do, because there are so many different methodologies when it comes to this stuff, and it's hard to tell when a particular guide is even going to be relevant to your goals. I could have looked up a general tutorial on making a humanoid, but how would I know the skeletal structure in the rigging phase would be compatible with VRChat? What if it wasn't even designed to be animated, it was just a sculpt for 3D still frame artwork? What if the presenter bored me out of ever wanting to pursue this? So finding the right guide is extremely important. That's where this next series comes in. This is an absolutely fantastic and comprehensive series on modeling, texturing, and rigging for animation purposes using Blender. 
What's great about it is not only the fact that it goes over just about everything required to make a fully functioning character model, but also the fact that it's by a guy who clearly knows what he's talking about when it comes to specifically modeling humanoids for animation. And unless you're planning on using a cardboard box as an avatar, you're going to want to know how to model a humanoid for animation. I don't mean this is just for people who plan on making custom animations for their avatars. Your avatar is animating any time a piece of software like a VTuber program makes it move. Trust me, you want to know how to set these things up right. This guy tells you exactly how to set up your edge loops and topology and make everything move as nice looking as possible. Try topologizing a human face without a guide on edge flow, I promise you will plunge yourself into a living nightmare. So Dicko here should get you sorted on how to achieve those proper edges I've been talking about. He does assume you have some knowledge of the program already, hopefully I've been able to get you comfortable enough with it, but if you find yourself lost, it might not be a bad idea to go back to the Mora Wizard Lizard videos. But you may find yourself lost if you're using Blender to follow a Maya guide. Wanna do what I did when I first started modeling? Download the free 30 day trial of Maya and slam the gas pedal. This has the added benefit of giving you a deadline, forcing you to not be lazy about it. Just make sure to export your model as an FBX or something else that Blender can recognize before your free trial expires, and then you can spend the rest of your life in Blender with Maya knowledge that is very easily translatable. Or like, actually pay for it, but if you had the money for that you probably could have just commissioned someone for all of this. In any case, if your goal is to make a humanoid character, do whatever you gotta do to be able to follow Dicko's tutorials. Trust me, that is where you want to be. There are quite a few things I had to learn to do on my own for my particular model that were not covered in either of these series though, especially when it comes to rigging, and I'm going to use the rest of these videos to go over them along with offering some general helpful tips to make your life easier than mine. You see, this is about building. I had to do things the extremely hard way before Dicko made his videos, and he helped me do things the regularly hard way. Now I'm going to try to help you do them the medium difficulty way. I highly recommend you watch the entire remainder of this series before you start, so you'll have an idea in mind of all the different things you'll have to account for, and then watching it again as you reach each step along the process. Let's get started. Okay, god, where do I even begin here? So, I guess first of all I'll show you what my model ended up looking like. Let me get rid of the clothes. Uh, let me shade this flat and like get rid of the subdivision modifier. You might notice the face is weird, that's because- let me hide this armature. Uh, the face looks weird, that's because of this right here. I will get into that on another, at another date, but basically, here's the raw body without any modifiers attached to it. You can see where I did the concentric circles around the lips, around the eyes, some extra edge loops around the elbows and the knees. This is not my topology, this is Dicko's topology. Like, everything you see here was done following him including like these abs here, which were pretty much not necessary, but I figured I'd add them anyway. Like this could have easily just been a simple little like, you know, the way the rest of the body is. Uh, I did not really end up doing the pelvis area that well, actually. You can see like there are lines following that crease pattern I was talking about, but not as well as I kind of should have. And that's just because of, well, dick and ass, really. I wanted a little bit of extra geometry over here to work with so that I could, um, yeah, we don't need to linger on that too much, but I also had to add some extra, like, I, listen, we all have our vices. The hardest part for me of this was figuring out how to do the clothing. Essentially what I did was I modeled out the entire body first and then for the clothes, I went ahead and- oh yeah, other tip here, you can like get a selection circle thingy here. You can press W to cycle between selection modes, um, and I can increase the radius of this and select a bunch of things at once. Basically through the clothes you just select a bunch of things on the body, and then uh, you can, you can go up here to mesh after selecting something, uh, click separate, and now you have another object up here, which is just those things. But you go here and then you can press Alt S to scale it and then bam you got clothes. Oh I probably should have copied that before separating it. But anyways what I did was I did that I got the clothes um, and they are not the exact same shape as the body underneath of them. You might notice here, uh, let's see if I, you can click on this and turn on wireframe to view a wireframe on everything, not just what you are currently, like the object you're currently on. So I can show you, you got this line up here, 
the sort of bikini line like vaguely it's not as perfect as it could be but then on here you don't really have it at all i maybe should have tried to do that on here but it's hard they don't really go into like i could not find any tutorial on how to make like a long shirt most things are like regular t-shirts where it ends like right here um above where that sort of crotch line is so you don't have to worry about it but what i did was i made that normal t-shirt and then i extruded some extra things downwards and um it's it, it's i uh, i tried my best it is functional uh if barely things don't bend ideally here but i was able to finagle it in the rigging phase to make it work but that was a whole fucking nightmare Anyways, uh, at a certain, like, you might be wondering, well, gee, Mac, that seems wasteful. Why, why would you have a body and clothes? Why not just do the clothes? Well, because you can transfer your weight paints from your body to your clothes once you're rigging it. And after that, like, at a certain point, you can go into your body and just say yeetus deletus to whatever stuff. And there, we don't have any of that anymore. We don't need it because, you know, and uh, you're going to want to do that once you start optimizing things. Both because you're going to be saving yourself on polygon counts to help performance, and also because uh, oftentimes your skin will clip through your clothes. Like if I were to bend this right now, this is a, uh, yeah, you see that? Let me turn on color. You see how like the underlying mesh starts clipping through the overlying thing? Like you got it down here as well. So you will be getting rid of underlying things eventually, just for now, just focus on modeling out the body and then the clothes. Follow the Dicko series, and don't worry about deleting the body until you get to the optimization stage, which is way at the end. I do have one possible complaint about the way he does it, and that is the knuckles. Now these look fine with the subdivision surface off, but once we add it, uh, and we like turn this off so we just see the raw stuff, Maybe it'll help if I turn this on. There's like these little weird bumps on the edges. They're not really a problem for the most part. Like they're very hard to notice most of the time. I did have like one scenario where with a certain lighting system you could see like it was being weird. You'd see like a ridge right here with like the shadow where it seemed like there shouldn't have been one. Um, it might be possible to, like, once you eventually apply the subdivision surface modifier, to go in and manually fix it up a little bit. But even that's going to be, like, a bit of an annoying process, and eh. So if you're worried about that, you might want to not necessarily do Knuckles the exact same way he does, but everything else he does very ideally, or at least from what I can tell. But, like, look at this face. That is, that is beautiful right there. Speaking of the face, let me revert what I just did. I modeled my face differently than his. He did like an actual eyeball inside the head. Um, however, most anime style, what the heck is that? Let me go to a newer revision of this model. This is like way back to before I deleted the underlying uh, body mesh. You'll see in a lot of anime avatars, they don't have like ball eyes. They have these sort of eye cavities with a floating iris inside. And um, it's not really hard to do. Let me um, select this. Oh, other super useful thing I forgot to mention. Control L to select links. This will select everything that is like physically connected to whatever your selection is. I can press H to hide this so we can see this eyeball cavity. Um, pretty self-explanatory. You just like, you'll have the eye hole and then you'll grab this edge and extrude inwards. And then, you know, add a couple extra things here and there. And then you'll have this uh, thingy. You can select this edge loop, go up here, face, grid fill. And it's probably going to be a little weird. You can mess with these span and offset settings. Uh, that's fairly reasonable looking. You want to make sure that the shape of it uh, let's say this is a top-down view right here. So like this is the front of the eye. Uh, you don't want this. You don't want this sort of eye bag in it because then when you have the pupil or the iris or whatever uh, and it like moves to the side, you might at certain angles start to see it clipping. Instead you want it like this where you have like plenty of room. Like make it go outwards as much as possible without it clipping through the side of the head, basically. 
That way when the iris moves, you have more room over here. I can show you what it would look like if it was done badly. Let me Alt H to unhide the iris. But if I were to go into pose mode and grab this eye and move it to where it's here, you can see it looks pretty good at every angle. However, if I didn't have this like extra space right here, if instead it was a bit more like a... Uh, let me shrink that down a little bit to simulate. You know, a bit more like that. Not as much room, then... Well, look at that. You can start seeing like the white as it intersects with it. You don't want to be able to see that. Make sure you give it enough room. Oh god, the hair, the hair, the hair, the hair. So... The hair was easily the hardest part of modeling this, and I kind of struggle to even think of what to tell you, if I'm being real. Oh, Jesus Christ, how do I even... Like, if I go back to works in progress of the hair, it's like... This is what I was kind of working with. It's... I, um, I can direct you to some videos that might be helpful to you, depending on the style you're going for. This is a relatively simple tutorial that involves using abstract curves to sort of guide your hair along certain lines. It involves making a series of strands that aren't actually connected directly to each other. However, this tutorial goes into this whole crazy setup where like the hair strands are connected to each other but they still flow around this like series of lattices. Uh, I ended up following this. I don't know if it made my life any easier. I'll have links to both of these in the description. I'll let you decide how you're gonna model your hair. Good luck is all I can say. One thing I can say, however, uh, something that I ended up doing was I made different versions of the hair, or different objects. I didn't just have one giant thing for all of them. I had this that I could mirror. This is like the uh, sides of the hair. Then I had a separate thing for the front bangs. This was because obviously these front bangs are asymmetrical. And well, you can't really have a mirror modifier to something that's asymmetrical. So I would do work on like this, and whatever I did to one side would be done to the other so I didn't have to do it twice. But then I would also have this front bang section. I also had another like layer underneath to add some extra depth and well, layers to it. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. And then eventually, once I was satisfied with how I had this, uh, main chunk of hair, and I was like, okay, I don't need this mirror modifier anymore, I went through this arduous process of combining both of these things, where I would, like, delete some of these faces here, to make a, like, a hole right there, and then I would delete some of these faces here, and I would try to line them up and connect them, and that took a while to get right, and you- I had to like delve into this fucking like- okay, so eventually I would apply the mirror modifier to the thing, and then I would uh- oh yeah, merging meshes, by the way. These are two separate objects right now. In order to merge them and like actually physically connect them to each other, you need to make sure your modifiers are the same. So I applied the mirror modifier to the other one, and these two now have the same subdivision modifier, which means we can safely press shift select and then control J to join them into one object. I would then go into here, and um, well, here's where things get a little messy, because I had to fucking look for where I- okay, so like this vertex should go to, um, to, to that? That one? Is that the one it should go to? Uh, if you go up here and you turn on face orientation, it can help a little bit because this shows you like what is the- Oh, that's wrong. Uh, I'm gonna control A, hit Alt N, and recalculate- Wait, uh, recalculate outside? Yeah. Uh, blue here is the outside of something, red is the inside of something. So now you can kind of see a little bit better of like, uh, um... This was by far the worst thing I had to ever do in 3D modeling. I would I would like count the number of edges on any particular thing, so I'd be like, okay, how many edges do I have on... Wait, hang on, I'm gonna hit this, Control-L, H to hide it, 
Okay, so I have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 there. So I'm gonna alt H unhide, uh, and I'm gonna hide this. So I need, I need like 10 here. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh oh, I only have 8 there. Uh, what if maybe if I get rid of like these and then and then that? Is that okay? Is or wait, I I, I had to like make sure they were the same shape, and then once they finally were the same shape, which I don't think this is, but let's just pretend it is, I'd have to be like, okay, so this vertex goes to this one. This one, I is that is that the one? Is that what am I looking at right now? I think it should go here. So I move it here, and then I shift click and then M, merge at center. Okay, now they're connected. Uh, I, mm -mm. Then I had to like mess around with this stuff up here to make sure this was able to. Uh, I'm just, I'm just venting at this point. But, but I, I'm not even giving advice. I'm just fucking rambling about what I had to go through. Now the reason I go through all of this, instead of just having the, uh, you know, like, hey, these are just going through each other. That's fine, right? Well, kinda. But also. It's not really good form, and there's a lot of problems you might not guarantee, but you might run into down the line. For example, uh, if you're going to have an outline around your model like I have on this one, if we use an outline and all this stuff is kind of clipping into each other, well, things start getting a little bit fucky-wucky, as you can see up here. And if you don't want that to happen, you're going to want to make sure that these are all actually connected properly. You will also notice shading errors. For example, you can clearly see how it's shading right here. This surface is in a different direction than this one. If it's even like slightly off, it's not going to look right. You can see this edge where everything starts like clipping through. So if you plan on using generated shading and or outlines, it's pretty important to make sure things are connected properly. If you don't plan on using either of those things, which you don't actually have to, I will go over that in the next video, then I guess you can probably say fuck it. It won't exactly be the best way of going about it, but I mean, if it makes your life easier and it does what you need it to do, then eh. Now, it might be possible to get it to look kind of passable if you clip your hair in ways that kind of mimic reality. For example, Avery here is working on their model, and um, Avery and I are currently trying to figure out whether they'll be able to get away with just clipping things through here rather than physically connecting everything, because the latter would be a very annoying process, as I'm sure I illustrated in this video. I told them to like very sloppily kind of merge their hair tentacles into each other at the uh, scalp. As you can see, they're all kind of going in, but they're going in at a place you'd expect, because like that's the top of the scalp, that is where hair goes in. Uh, could you toggle it off, the wireframe off again? It's to the right. <laughs> you can find- you can do it! No, no. There. Wait, no, you're in edit mode now, so you're gonna see it anyway. You can click, a, click on the viewport and, or that, yeah, that's fine. No! Now, the shading here is a little fucky-wucky, but, like, hair is kind of a little fucky-wucky at that point anyway, so it might not end up looking that terrible if you do decide to clip through things here while using generated shading. Just be mindful of what you're trying to do and what your plans are for your hair. With my hair, uh, things were not merging at the scalp, they were clipping through at like the top of the bangs, which is a very weird spot, so it would have looked very odd if I chose not to physically connect them there. Is there anything you'd like to say to the audience? Hi. Continuing on through my many, many files that I made throughout this uh, documenting my journey, and to uh, expand on that point I mentioned about mirror modifiers and applying things and all that. As you can see, my shirt is asymmetrical. However, I have a mirror modifier on this here shirt. And what you need to do for that is basically every single detail that you can add in that is on both sides added in. Uh, this little sort of ridge sticking out here on there and on here. The collar, which at this point was incomplete. 
making sure all the topology is how I want it, making sure that everything, you know, curves how I want it. And only then will I apply the mirror modifier and begin making it asymmetrical by grabbing this, for example, turning on proportional editing, and whoops. Oh yeah, symmetry. Uh, there's a thing up here that you can enable symmetry on, and whatever you do to one side, you'll do to the other, which in some cases makes mirror modifiers unnecessary, but they're still good to have in general. Just make sure you're also aware of when this is or is not on. So I'm gonna turn that off so that I can move this down to, you know, I was a little bit more careful with how I originally did it, but you know. Also on the topic of clothes, don't model in clothing folds until after UV unwrapping. Oh my god, my life could have been so much easier. Well, you don't actually need to model in clothing folds at all. You can just imply them with shading and normal maps and like texture work and stuff. I personally chose to physically make them, however. And the way I did that was... I would have like a line here, and let's say I wanted to add one. Um, I could just like take the knife tool and go whoop, 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 tool. You know, like that. Then uh, get rid of these lines at the edges here, dissolve them so that these are still four sided uh, polygons. And then I can do this. Uh, Alt S is also useful for times like this, by the way. Because, let's say I want this to come out exactly in the direction it's facing, and normally you would like drag this and try to get it right, but I can just press Alt-S, and um, it'll go out in that direction. You can also uh, use proportional editing with scaling, like, uh, along normals and stuff. Very helpful. But the problem with this is, once you go into UV editing, and you start unwrapping your shirt. I just realized I never explained what UV unwrapping is. We'll get to that next episode, don't worry. So here's what my shirt looks like unwrapped. I can, um, if I select, here we go, we can like, this is the torso right here. See how it's all nice and square and it perfectly lines up and uh, it lends itself well to this horizontal stripe texture I made. That ain't how it started. You might notice all these red dots on the edges here. These are things that I pinned in place. If I were to select all of these, uh, clear that pin, and then let the program unwrap it the way it wants to unwrap it, we had this fucking nightmare. And it's like, okay, that's cool. Uh, I'll try to put it on where it's... Uh... Now, if I didn't have these clothing folds here, my life would be a little bit easier because I could have used this uh, UV squares plugin and like make it into a grid thing, but it doesn't really work when you have all this extra topology on top of it. So what I had to do then was I went and I like selected this whole edge loop, S, Y, 0, scale that to 0, move that down, pin those in place, and I did it along and like made everything into a square, which took longer than you might expect because I had to like, you gotta make sure the edges here are lined up with the edges here. So like it's not good enough to just take this and then scale it to zero on the X and then move it to the side and then do it right here too. That's not good enough. Because when we look at the seam here, that's not right. I had to also grab each little dot right here and make it scale each one of these to the same Y value. So that I... <laughs> just wait until after you make this nice square grid for your clothes before you start modeling and clothing folds, if you're even going to do that. All right, let's see, extra tips. Uh, save a new iteration every time you do anything destructive. What do I mean by destructive? Well, for example, here's my body mesh. I have several modifiers on it. There's the armature so that it actually has bones. There's the subdivision surface modifier so that it has extra topology. There's the data transfer modifier to correct the lighting on my face. Well, in Blender, let's say I was ready to add my shape keys for the different facial expressions. Every time my eyes move or my mouth opens, that is a different shape key. So I went in here and I'm, I got the basis. Now let's make the mouth open up. Make a open up big and wide and you know, and then I made like 20 fucking shape keys. And then I was like, all right, cool, I did it. I'm gonna now apply my modifier, my subdivision modifier, because this is gonna be my high res version for like VRM applications. This low poly thing is gonna be for VR chat. But now I'm gonna make the super fancy one for... 
Modifier cannot be applied to a mesh with shape keys. Interesting. That means if we want to make shape keys, we need to get rid of all these modifiers. Well, except for the armature. That one's fine. This is what is known as a destructive process, because right now we can have our subdivision surface modifier and we can enable it on or off depending on when we want it to be smoother or not. But once we apply it, there is no going back. We can no longer make it less smooth. I mean, technically, we could if we added a decimate modifier, but uh, let me tell you, this uh, ain't gonna necessarily work too well. Actually, this uh, unsubdivide thing is doing a pretty decent job, but that's not always going to be the case. There will many a time be moments where if you want to decimate something, it's it's not, it's going to be like a nightmare. Like right now, we literally haven't done anything to it, so it can very easily unsubdivide our subdivision that we just applied. But like, if we were to do a regular decimate thing and we collapsed some of these and this ratio down a little bit, just make myself a little, little, little crustier. We applied that. Ooh, yeah, that's what we want, right? No. So we're pretty much committing once we apply this uh, subdivision surface modifier. That means I'm gonna click save as right here and name it a new thing. Maco 71 apply subdivide. And I'm gonna be very sure that there wasn't anything else I could have done before applying that. Like, I'm perfectly satisfied with how the body is at that point, and I'm ready. I know for a fact that I'm not going to have too many tries, too many polygons after applying that. You can see if I will disable some of the subdivision modifiers and some of these other things. Uh, with the subdivide modifier off on the body, I have 58,000 tries. With it on, I have 88,000 tries. VR Shot has a 70,000 try limit. You're not supposed to go above that. So I gotta be real sure before I do this, but it's what I want. Other examples of destructive things can even be things as simple as uh, changing this foot right here. Like, let's say I don't like how this looks, maybe I wanted this thing to uh, be over here more. And then I like spent like 20 minutes working on this and like adjusting it and fine tuning it and stuff. I'm not going to just hit Control S, I'm going to save it as a new thing because I just changed something and I'm not confident enough in myself to know whether or not this was the best decision. Like if you're, if just anytime you do anything, make a new iteration. Okay, I have um, nearly a hundred separate iterations. You can see all the different things I did here. And I'm glad I made that many because there were often times where I made a big change and I regretted it and I went back to like something from hours before instead of having to redo all of that. Just just trust me on this, okay? It will save you from ruining your life anytime you make some sort of catastrophic screw up or you do something that it turns out it wasn't really what you should have done. You can go through and delete all your extra blend files after your model if you really want, but for the time being, have them on hand. Control S all the fucking time. Do it. Every time I spam a bunch of redos, there is about a 20% chance that Blender will crash on me. Do not trust this damn program for a second. It's also just terrible practice to not save often. It boggles my mind that there are people who will do a bunch of work on something and then minimize the window without even saving and then go off to do something else. Then you have the power outage, your windows decides to force to restart for an update while you're sleeping and you just lost everything you did. The Control S hotkey should be as natural to you as Control Z. I hit it pretty much any time I finish any quantifiable action. Clean up the weight paints on my arms, Control S. Add a new modifier, Control S. Add a new edge loop, Control S. The only exception is when I'm making some sort of change that I'm not 100% confident I'm going to keep, but is not big enough to warrant a new file iteration. For example, using the blur tool during weight painting. I don't fucking trust that shit, and I like to thoroughly examine the results before saving. You might want to extrude something, only to change your mind and cancel it, and then you'll go to extrude it again. Make sure when you control Z, you control Z to before the initial extrusion. Otherwise, you might find yourself with some double ghost vertices. Cause when you do this, then you hit escape. It doesn't actually cancel your extrusion, it just cancels the translation of your extrusion. It's still there, it's just not moved yet. So if you go back too far, you can always hit Control shift z to go to right before you did the initial extrusion. You can move things around in object mode and set them at weird angles, and then in edit mode, 
click on local to have things be relative to how they originally were. So I can move this up and down this way perfectly now. At some point you will probably want to go back into object mode and select the item, hit Control A, and apply all transforms. And that will set the location and rotation back to zero, scale back to one, and essentially reset it. Now the origin points back down here at the origin of the world. Especially if you want to add a mirror modifier to it. Otherwise... Yeah. Avoid adding extra geometry like the plague. I already explained earlier how it's much easier to add extra than it is to get rid of stuff that's already there. But you should really look around and ask yourself, do I really need all of these right here? Or could I probably just dissolve a couple of these edge loops and then slide some of these down and not lose anything at all? And I think that about covers it. Uh, good luck and have fun. Watch Dicko's tutorials and come back once you've got your whole model done, aside from clothing folds, and we will move on to the comparatively less time-consuming texturing phase.